Says where is still not. Hey guys. Thanks for joining me on our first YouTube live video. Sorry, we're just kind of getting situated here. This this particular setup is a little bit new. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Oh no. Our settings at the same time, just to make sure everything can hear me, please let me know in the chat comments which way. So while I'm waiting for a few people to jump in, I'm gonna I'm going to sketch just a little bit more so that it doesn't seem so boring. And here, and my lovely assistant, Miss Katie, here to help with any questions if anybody. It is the nose is pointed on the side. Is that how it's supposed to be? Mm. That way it is. is it pointed? So it's pointed to the left? Yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting. My preview looks the exact other way. On the, <laughs> on the computer, it is the exact opposite. And it sort of freaked me out when I was looking at it earlier trying to see preview. I was like, man, that is wrong. That is wrong? <laughs> no, that's yeah, it correct on yours, which is good. But uh, literally, if you look over here on the computer, it is completely wrong. So that's actually kind of a relief. Let me know if there's much lag or latency. Um, obviously, I'm watching the live on the computer. So it's going to happen a little bit on one side than the other. Actually, there's some heads there on the table. You want to grab them, plug them in, just make sure that uh, sound's coming through? Uh, I can go grab mine first. Yeah, if you'd like. Because it's already connected. Mine are already connected. Oh, that's right. You've got the Bluetooth. Yep, yep. Sorry. All right. so that's cool. I'm going to keep heavy enough. Yeah. I'm going to heavy up this line sketch just a little bit more before I dye the colors, and then I'll kind of break down the materials that I'm going to use for that. And um, again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to jump in. My phone's making noise at me. So uh, what I'm finishing my uh, sketch here with is a blue Bic pen. This is my favorite thing to draw with. Just like the end result of it, quite a lot. A little bit smeary and a little bit messy. Wow, the computer's better than my phone. Well, it ought to, but see, it's backwards. Oh, yeah. Isn't that annoying? <laughs> <laughs> it's like looking at a mirror. It's, yeah. It's wrong. It's all wrong. Uh -oh. It's fine. So once I get some of these line weights plotted out a little bit better, then I will switch over to uh, ink. And we'll get to coloring. I've already picked materials I'm going to use, uh, just like I do for pretty much any art piece. I'm going to make sure that I've thought enough steps ahead to make sure that I've got the airbrush paints mixed up and that the colors that I'm going to use I have enough of uh, to get all the way through something. Because the last thing you want to do is run out of materials while you're working. It's funny to hear you talking, and then like a few seconds later, you're just. <laughs> so at least the sound is coming through. Yeah. Oh, good. 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 Just want to be sure. All right. So hello to anyone who's jumping in. Um, you guys, have any questions while I'm working? I'm just about to start throwing some color at this thing. Um, this is actually a sketch that I posted a few days ago that I finished in a different way, and I thought it'd be really great to finish this in a traditional way. I'm going to do markers, airbrush straight on this guy, and once I finish up a couple of the other little line bits here, I'm going to jump right into it, and I'll try to stop repeating myself. All right, so the colors I've picked for this one are going to be a little bit basic and simple, which should help speed through this somewhat, but uh, I'll try to explain it as I go. So, let me grab a couple of colors off my bank here. All right, so since I already know that I'm going to work in started. And so the way that I render with color, I'm already imagining the direction I want light to go. Um, and since I actually did a pre-rendering of this uh, earlier anyway, it's going to make my life a little bit easier because I've already thought about how I want to put color everywhere. I'm wondering why my, my phone is lagging. Is uh, lagging? My phone is, yes. In what way? Well, like it'll, 
it'll be fine and then i'll pause for a couple seconds and then it sort of makes back. sense yeah we're trying to stream hd so it might just be one of those things so marker streaks that overlap pretty good so that we can saturate the areas in a single pass rather than trying to make a million passes to, to get an area with a solid color. So okay. being quick with the marker strokes and deliberate and uh, just allowing the paper to saturate really cleanly so that the ink kind of looks like one shape instead of 10 million streaks as it's going along. The way that some of these lines are plotted are going to help describe the uh, body at the same time. What year Porsche is this? This is an air-cooled Porsche, so it kind of fits a, a wide generational when I was sketching it, so oh <laughs> it would be unfair to call it one exact year. It's, we'll just go with air cool. <laughs> That'll work. Um, Volkswagen. I've been asking about a, a Volkswagen. Yeah. And ask one more question, and then they freaking call it. We'll never seconds. leave you alone again. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> They just like you. They just want you. They, they want to sell you a car. Buy, so. Yeah. They really want you to buy a car. Mm -hmm. And there's later stages where I'm going to airbrush over almost all of this ink. But the basic reason for wanting to plot down like solid uh, blocks of color first is so that I have something to airbrush over. So I'm making the body color happen now so that later I can soften up and do all the details on top of this. So I more or less just use the markers to uh, fill in the major blocks of color. You can do with an airbrush or pencil or any other tool. I just find markers to be a nice, clean way to get there. Well, we have a comment, Roberto. Kiroga uh, says, hello, Chris. Thanks for posting and sharing your experience with us. Absolutely, absolutely. And I try to have this process as simply as possible. Thank you for coming along. I apologize if I said your last name wrong. I'm terrible at <laughs> names. It's all good. So this stage, you know, just starting to block in the initial color probably occupies most of the time at this stage just because uh, you don't necessarily need to be especially careful. You know, of course, I want to stay within my lines here, but allow my space, allow some space to be creative at the same time because there's so much space to, to fix and make changes as I go. Um, so I want to be careful, but not overly uh, not overly ambitious, so I'm not like burying an entire thing in color right away. I need to leave some space because it's ink, it's dye based. I need to leave some space for all the stages that are going to come next. So it'd be really easy just to say, I'm going to color this entire thing in with color, but uh, we need to translate the way that light is going to work at the same time. So, and sometimes I'll do a couple passes over marker. Um, just to kind of re-wet everything or resaturate, but red is a pretty forgiving color in this way, so we don't have to go too crazy because uh, I can airbrush a lot more of the color transition over top of this, and I think that format will make a little bit more sense to keep the details good. Is it going to be like an orange red? It's going to be whatever red comes close to this red, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, so yeah, probably um, in color trans tra transition, sometimes reds will come up either more orangey or warmer or a little bit more pink, which is a little cooler. It kind of depends on the, the light a little bit. Um, so but in this case, it does seem to be like it's going to be a warmer, warmer red. All right, enough pecking on that. So 
I actually feel pretty good about that as the initial starting point for just marker. So I'm going to leave that one out so that I know, so I can refer to it over and over again. And I'm going to break out some some gray tail markers so that we can start to fill in some of these larger areas. And again, I'm usually using markers as the basis for what I'm going to airbrush over. So the marker or paint or whatever I'm using to create big shapes, um, just so I can make these really big areas cleanly, so that when I'm airbrushing later, I don't have to do any masking, because I prefer not to if I don't have to. But this will help just fill these areas in nice and clean, so that when I airbrush over them, I can do the soft transitions into this nice big color block, so I can maintain soft edges and hard edges at the same time. Um, and you can just do, but you can use each tool for its strength. And that's what I like airbrush for. And this marker is dying on me just a little bit. So let's switch over to a different one. We always keep extra on hand. I always have to have lots and lots of markers. So, and same with the red, I don't need to go, you know, a lot of these areas will end up having a lot of black in them towards the end, uh, but I don't want to start out with black. I want to be able to transition later with the airbrush over top of this ink. Because once you put black down, it's, you can't take it back. Yeah, and it can get really heavy really, really quick. And while you can detail over it with some white and bring it back up, and, and that will be something that I do as well. It's just a little bit simpler not to overcommit to the really, really dark values right away. There's some shadow areas that I know are going to be black right away, but because I'm going to do airbrushing, it's not important to kill those things right away with so much tone. Because we want to balance contrast at the same time. It's like I got a few markers I need to replace. You use Copic markers, right? Currently, I'm using chart pack markers. Chart pack. Yes, but I will use Copics if I if I need to for something, um, you know, a specific range of colors or grays that are better in one brand than another. So I'll bounce back and forth around to whatever I need to in order to uh, to get the illustration right. So, switching over to a different gray tone now. If you guys have any questions or comments, just put them down. I'm, I'm watching the, the comment feed. So if you have any questions, feel free. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'm just starting to do is, as I'm using a slightly darker grays at a time, to just start to make some of these areas a little bit more defined, especially, say, like the window gaskets, I already know are going to be dark, but not necessarily black. You know, I might use black later, but as I mentioned before, I would rather be able to build up to the tone than dial back. In some cases, I will want to just dial back, but this is early on, so we don't want to just start plotting in too much high contrast right away because it can make it really hard to balance an image later, especially since we're working on white paper. So, let's see here. Start to action up the glass a little bit, just so that it's not overly boring. And while I've got the gray tones out, I can start to work on a little bit of everything that falls in the same family, um, so that I'm not jumping. I mean, I'm jumping around a little bit because I want the ink to dry in this area before I do anything else with it. Um, so. It's nice to have a handful of things to work on and jump around with at a time. And thankfully it's ink, so I can uh, you know I can keep putting my hand everywhere I need to without worrying about picking up anything and making a mess. It's not always true with paintings, but it works really good. 
in the case of ink. All right, so with where I'm at, I've got some, some really good base tones here, and I'm gonna start to consider how I wanna do, let's say like parts of the rear glass. A lot of this is gonna be airbrushed, but if you wanna define a little bit of the edge, a lot of it has the big pen outline, which will help define the shape later when I'm airbrushing over everything. But also now I'm gonna to start to consider what I'm gonna do with the wheels. So in my mind, I already have an idea of how I'm gonna do them um, or what I want them to look like. So again, because it's ink, we wanna start with the lightest colors and kind of work down from there. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter that I'm not staying within the lines probably see I'm going pretty far outside the lines here, but um, but it doesn't matter because all this is going to get colored in black or toned with shadow. Rebelling against the lines. Rebelling against the lines. <laughs> um, and even these areas and these hoops, I'm going to do all those transitions with an airbrush. I can do it with marker, but it will make for a better demo if we just do them with airbrush. And well, I've got one of my darker grays out. I'm gonna go ahead and just fill in this entire area here because I know that I want the wheel to represent being black or satin black. And in the process of doing so, I'm gonna I'm gonna bury the pen drawing a little bit. That means I'm gonna have to do some really confident guesswork later um, to where the spokes are and things like that. But this is part of why I like drawing in big pen because the the line work will still show through even as I'm putting really dark tones in. Now, if I'm just put black over it, it would be really hard to start picking out the details. Not impossible, you just have to be really confident at guessing. Um, and then of course I have you know, the original sketch that I can refer to as well for the points where that information would be. But while it's there, I'll go ahead and run over some of these lines with a big pen anyways, just to make sure that I don't lose them in the process of making all this stuff. And I don't need to go over every single line. I just need the uh, basic spoke pattern so that that doesn't get lost. Everything that's in between, I'm familiar with enough to do from memory. So don't worry about too, too much. So just kind of re-sketch those in a little bit pen. And part of why I like pen as well, because doing this with, uh, with pencil, going over with ink, it'll just smear to get all over the place and that can get hard to bring back and keep looking clean also just has this really nice technical look to it that I like. all right and again because i'm going to end up doing the wheels dark uh, either a dark gray or more of a black and so much of the detail will be lost the detail that will make it look right will be in how my heads are done so, so i'm probably walking in the shadow area it's going to be a little bit because it looks like some of my markers are a little unhappy with me right now. But win some, lose some. So actually, the next thing I'm going to do is have a pink marker. A pink marker? Pink marker! So um, even though I wouldn't always do it this way, since we're here, because these are areas that I want to have lots of color as well, which I'd be able to do with an airbrush, but it'd be a little bit more predictable at this stage with marker. All right, so far. Red to me is a pretty pretty forgiving color to uh, to render, so I keep saying it's kind of fun and loose pretty easily. All right, so now what I'll do is the ground shadow area to start to bring some shape into that. Now again, I want to be careful about not using a whole lot of black right away, even though this is going to be the darkest area here, and there's going to be a lot of airbrushing in there. But I want to be careful not to bring too much black in too early. I want it to be more of a detail rather than a huge blob at once. So I'm going to take a different shade of gray. And this one's definitely really wet. You probably want to chase everything really carefully with a different marker first. 
just to make sure I don't kill my lines. What's up? Which other marker? With a different shade of uh, gray. Oh. Um, every now and then I'll reduce the markers here and they'll be really, really saturated, which is nice. But trying to go carefully around some lines can be a little trickier when the markers are like brand new and super wet. Um, so that's why I wanna, would want to slow down and maybe use a different marker so that in case I get too much somewhere all at once, it's not like black. It would be fixable later, but you try to create the least amount of challenges. All right, I'll run around this guy real quick, and then we'll go back to the darker marker. Cool. All right. So now that we've got that, I can start to figure out how I want to do the shadow lines, even though I airbrush them still. A nice clean base to start with. Which I can use an airbrush, even if it wasn't a super case, it's just nice to start with one that has a little bit more predictability in it. And when using markers, it's important to take into account the direction of the marker strokes so that everything kind of seems a little bit more unified and a little bit less haphazard. Well, I don't mind a little bit of zigzag in some of it. It's fine as long as it's part of the character we're drawing, but if it looks accidental, then it looks kind of amateur. So I try, try to be careful about stuff like that. And now I can take that darker gray and start to transition it into the gray that I put down earlier. And a lot of this will be airbrushed, so I don't want to go too crazy in here. I just want to get the values in this gray a little bit darker before I switch back over to the other gray and bring it around a little bit more. I love this type of stuff. It's very, very push-pull. But, uh, but ink has its limit of forgiveness, so we can't just keep pushing and pulling forever. Eventually, eventually we'll have too much and we'll have to correct in a different way, but that's all right. All right, so now I'm going to switch to a different gray to blend these just a little bit. I'm not going to get really crazy with blending the area because I'm going to airbrush over it a lot. Let's see if I can find a better, better middle tone here. All right, so I realize these look nothing like each other in the family of grays here, but we're going to transition from one to the other. So... So we don't want to take a dark marker and try to lightly streak it down. We want to go the other way. We want to take a light marker and try to streak it up. And then I'm going to airbrush this transition anyways. But I like a shadow that has kind of a bit more illustrative and comic booky. It just has a little bit more action towards the end. Yeah, I like that too. Yeah, it's just it'll be a little more interesting. I'm going to airbrush over it, but it'll still breathe through the airbrushing. Again, just gives it a little bit of a hole. And while the inks are wet, I can work some of these edges a little bit. I gotta be careful because some of my markers are a little bit dry. But a dry marker also has a kind of a All right, so while that's doing its thing, you know, the ink is drying and it's also blending together at the same time. And the nature of how uh, marker papers work. I take a lighter, lighter gray and go around the outside edges to kind of soften that up just a little bit so it doesn't seem too harsh around the edge. And some of this will come back or be pushed forward and backwards as it's being airbrushed, but it's nice to be able to work the edges. I want some edges to be sharp and some of them to be darker. Um, so try to manage those early on is really helpful. All right, so a lot of the base tone in marker actually. We're actually done already. It doesn't seem like this would be the gateway to go as far, but it actually is. There's like 70% of the work is already done. Everything else from here is details, edges, and transitions. 
So I'm trying to keep the lighting somewhat uniform. Which is why I like to draw in this perspective in the first place. It's just a little bit more interesting than something you can just Google search. It's not totally, totally normal. I referred to it the other day as like a, a drone shot. And I thought that was a really cool way to describe what it was. All right. So now we've got most of these tones done in a way where we're about at the limit of what marker can handle as far as what I'm doing here. Um, we're about ready to jump into some airbrushing so that we can start to transition these colors. And, um, and keep everything defined. So right now, we pretty much just have harsh edges, which is nice. It'll help make something look really, really glossy. But we need to soften some of them up, like these long transitions here, which I could do with a marker, but I prefer the predictability of airbrush. It just works better for me. Um, real quick, since we've got the body color transition going here, we want to do the same thing with the glass. So everything looks like it's uniform and happening in the same. Bunch of markers set out and jumping back and forth in between. But you know, as something's coming together, looking at the uh, the color transitions, the bars of contrast, and uh, just trying to make them look uniform. So that all right, so for where we are, I think we're ready to switch over, almost ready to switch over to the airbrush. Airbrush time, yeah. It's almost airbrush time. There's just a couple little areas in here that I want to hit really quick with some light gray, just to add a little bit of value in there. Because even though some of these areas I'm going to come back and detail with white, it's nice to start with uh, with a little bit of gray so that the white pops a little bit more in the end. Just kind of looking over the shapes of stuff that I got, trying to figure out what I would want to clean up. color a little bit. You don't want to get too heavy handed here. Yep, yep. So, and at this point, since I'm getting ready to jump into airbrushing, I want to make sure I have as much of, if not all of the marker artwork, marker part of the artwork done, because it'll get really hard to add marker from here once the airbrushing is on. Not impossible, but I prefer to keep the stages split up enough so that one doesn't interfere with the other. Because at that point, marker was, then it will just on the paper. And it can be, can be an advantage if you, plan, if you plan for it. So the only other thing that I would do while I'm here, I was just looking at everything going, wait, there's something else. I was going to add some, some mid value on the red in a marker that's somewhere else. Here. There we go. <laughs> in a basic gray. Somewhere. Yeah. So this is just a what's considered a what uh, chart pack anyway. It's called a basic gray. It's actually more like purple, and because it's just a gray going over top of the main color, it's essentially tinting the color darker without simply adding red. Because if you just keep going over it with red, you can oversaturate the paper, and eventually the colors will look dull anyway. But adding some gray over top of the red, but at core high saturation anyways. Your high saturation is going to be your transition areas. Anyways, so I can take just this gray over top of the existing red that I already have and start to make some shape just out of that by itself. And I could do the same thing with an airbrush, and I will, but it's nice to sort of plot some of this with marker because, again, the marker is going to create the hard shapes and the uh, airbrush is going to create the soft shapes, at least in the way that I work. So considered all of those things in this stage. The contrast is starting to come around. That core colors are a little bit darker to me anyway. It's starting to make a little bit more sense. I'll grab a slightly lighter version of that same thing to pull the transition into the red a little bit. And again, we don't want to get too heavy handed here because we just bury everything really, really quickly. So being selective about where these things are happening. And at the same time, if I feel like I've washed out the color a little bit in this area, I can put some red back. I mean, it's only going to act so far anyways, but. Um, 
but it will work to uh, to bring back the color a little bit because it should be slightly desaturated in these areas anyways, just because the light works. So where we want our vibrancy is these upper areas, which is part of why I'm not doing them with marker. I'm doing them with airbrush. I know that I'll get the most out of them anyways. All right, while I'm here, go ahead and hit this with a little bit of tone so that when I airbrush over it, it's still there. I don't want to lose it or get buried in the process of doing any of this. Yes, yes. So I've already, uh, already mixed colors. We've got the Create Paints today. So always keep an extra page on hand so that I can test the airbrush while I'm working so that I don't get surprised by it. Surprises are cool, but not when you're doing artwork, not really. We don't want those kind of surprises. Because then it's ruined, and then we're <laughs> nothing. Sure. And there's there's a fix and a workaround for everything. I've run into so many mistakes that I've made personally. So, but um, but the less mistakes you're fixing on the back end, you know, the nicer it is. So just testing the airbrush. It probably needs to be cleaned a little bit. But it's gonna work for what we're doing. I need a new airbrush. I can just tell. I've had <laughs> it's a decade on this one, and it's just not happy like it used to be. But for big transition areas like this, it's going to work fine. Um, if I was to do more detailed work, I would probably want to just go and buy another airbrush. So, but I've tested the airbrush. I know that I'm not getting any blood in the airbrush. Yeah, transitions are already cleaning up. There we go. Starting to make more sense. So, set this guy aside. And. It's a, it's inherently it's a really thin paper, so it's delicate. So you can oversaturate it and warp it, and as a finished piece of work, it doesn't, it's not super attractive. There's workarounds, but the best workaround is to not get overly aggressive right off the bat. Just allow the material to build up slowly the way that it needs to. Just be patient. And also make working without a mask in the way that I am a lot easier too predictability and taking your time. There's certain areas where it's important to be fast and work, you know, just more quickly, but not right at this stage. You want to be deliberate and patient at the same time. So, and obviously I'm not taking color all the way up to the edge. I want a little bit of fog in the edge for the stages that I'll share after the airbrushing is done. And obviously you can tell I started with the body color first and not black. Position some of the other areas over top of the red. So I want to get the red sorted first. So not totally sure that it'll show up on camera, but the upper area, at least the more I'm looking at it, much more um, much more pink, less less warm and more more magenta versus being like a red or sorry, an orangey red. It's because the upper areas normally will just have a, a brighter saturation and be slightly cooler because the upper ends are usually reflecting the sky. And these transition areas are going to be what helps make the color look like it has some actual shine and the color has some depth, which is why it's really important not to be heavy handed because you can overdo it and just cut everything in very quickly. And even though I'm working without a mask, I'm still, you know, hopefully using experience to get, know when to stop, when to pull back, and when to just not overdo it. So I want to put paint down, let it dry, and kind of evaluate as I go so that I don't overdo it all at once. Even though I'd colored in this area with marker before, now that it's, it has a solid color of ink, and I can airbrush over it a little more freely without a mask to get the color temperature correct. I want all the upper areas to have the same character of pink, otherwise it'll start to look a little bit confused. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll use this opportunity to go over as much of the body color anyways as possible, just to kind of get the saturation up. But it's not totally important at this stage uh, because of the way that I have the light and the shadow, you know, having a whole lot of saturation down here won't help or hurt in the same way, but sometimes we'll just go with what's a, what's a better visual appeal, what will look better as a piece of artwork. 
and just uh, punch up the saturation a little bit more. Because ink markers will have this limit on how saturated they can get on paper, because paper is absorbent. So it's going to kill back some of that intensity anyways. Whereas airbrush over top of it is always going to be more vibrant just because it's over top. And it's, you know, especially in the case of white, you're allowing the color to breathe through. So you're going to get a lot, lot more saturation. Um, and I can even go over the red with the marker, that's marker, with paint, and I'll be able to brighten that red up so much more. Um, but because of that, I'm going to be selective about how you do it. If I just wanted to go over everything, then it would be really smart to be doing some masking so that I can keep all the lines nice. Um, but I like a little bit of desaturation and saturation at the same time. So that it starts to look a little bit more natural. It'll still be bright and comic booky, but still has some basis in reality. And these core areas is where I really want the most saturation, so that's where I'm making the most passes, but allowing the paint to dry as much as possible in between so that I'm not warping the paper. And get this area a little bit more saturated because I know how I'm going to do the black afterwards. Um, it's going to bring the saturation down as well. So I just want to make sure I've got the color good before anything else. What's that? It's coming out really good. Thank you. I don't know what it's looking like on your screen, but I'm looking at it on paper. It looks totally different than my computer monitor over here. My computer monitor looks very orange. Well, Maybe. I was asking, like, it's really looking orangey. <laughs> There's parts of it that are orangey red, but probably not as much as it apparently looks like. So I'm going to try to I'm gonna be careful on these long transition areas because I'm not doing any masking. I'm going to get close to the area where the cool light's going to be specifically for the next part of the process where I'm going to remove some of the paint. Uh, but because I'm not masking, I have to be extra careful during around headlights and the open areas. Um, I could mask this, and that might be a good thing to do in a different demo video to kind of show what that's like. I'm simply not doing it for the sake of demonstration. Oftentimes, I don't mask because I like the natural look of airbrush overspray around everything. It helps to soften up the look a little bit. To me, it looks a little bit more natural. But if I'm doing something that I want to be extra, extra sharp, I will absolutely mask around everything. But, um, but it's also very time consuming. So I only do it if I feel like it benefits the end result by a lot. So, and I'm uh, airbrushing red. And because I have it thinned down and I'm working very lightly, it's coming up as a highly saturated pink because it's going over white and it's thinned out a lot. So that is the end result is pink. So I didn't mix pink. It's literally this very transparent red. All right. So actually I'm going to come in here a little bit more on the roof so that I can pull some of it out, which will make sense hopefully in a second here. Yeah. Coming in a little bit harder over here. All right. That's looking good so far. You see the color depth looks really good and I'm really digging the shadow. It's going to get airbrushed over to, to clean it up, but as like an illustrative dynamic, it looks really cool. So the next thing I'm going to do is grab an eraser, if I can find one. Surely there's an eraser around here somewhere. I have a rainbow eraser. That might be a little bit too big. Um, the erasers are actually on the other side of the room, so I have to make do. Hang on one second. Is it near me? No. Oh, no. No, yes. All the way on the other side of this thing. Oh, yep. Yeah. Okay. So, but I've got the airbrushed areas where I went up to the line pretty carefully. The next thing I'm going to do is take uh, an eraser and clean up that edge a little bit. If I'm really careful about overspray in the way that I was here, I allowed a lot, a lot of open area. I can actually take a, an eraser and pull out almost all the overspray. This stage where I'm using the eraser for is to maybe pull off some of this pink in the glass because I'm going to come over with a different tone here. Um, and I'm not going to get really, really carried away. I just want to make the edge look a little bit more deliberate. 
So kind of taking the soft nature of the airbrush tool and firming up the edges of the look a little bit. I can run on the outside of the body here where there's a little bit of pink overspray and start to clean that up. But honestly, there wasn't that much because of the way that I airbrushed it, everything was pretty light and fluffy. And I like to leave a little bit of that overspray, like I mentioned, because I just, I like the look of something. It just looks a little bit more natural to me, even though I have this really heavy pen outline. So same thing, taking an eraser and cleaning this area here. The way light color works on, say, glossy surfaces is our highlight is oftentimes going to be right next to the darkest part of the light. So where the core color is, is going to be neighbors to where the brightest part is. And that's part of what gives us the glossy look. Right where it's dark, right next to that is right where it's light. Get kind of this light bar look. And if I wanted to be even more careful, because I'm using a firm eraser at this point, you can take a kneaded eraser and pull it back a little bit more softly. So if I wanted to make this into what seemed like a white airbrushed edge, I can just take a kneaded eraser and very carefully pull it back. So go from the hard edge to the soft edge a little bit more. And it's Createx's that really allow that to happen. You could do it with acrylics, but the vibrancy of these paints they work so nicely in the airbrush because they're designed for it. And then on top of that, the reversibility, the ability to erase some of these um, things, which is called subtractive highlighting, is part of what the, is designed into the paints, which is part of why I like them so much. Because I like this part. I like to be able to erase some of the paint as I'm going. Um, I'm not able to do this like when I'm working on canvas. But in illustration, which is to be considered way more traditional illustration rendering, it's possible. So it's nice to have as, a, uh, as an ability to use. And I really didn't have to do too much here. And a lot of these illustrations, if I'm rendering in black something, there'll be a lot more blue or black overspray coming out towards the edges. But because the direction is so harsh on this one, some of the way the outside stuff looks, I like. So I'm not going to spend too much time um, subtracting anything, uh, anything else past this. But also, if anybody's curious about the uh, the Createx illustration paints, so I'm just using the red and reducing it and putting some medium in it, and that's what I shot over this. This is just darker paper and shot straight over the ink, and now I'm just saying uh, erasing out a little bit of the paint that I don't want to kind of start to create our high highlights, which I'll still go over later with paint, but it's nice to kind of do everything in this soft transitional way. I might pull out a little bit from this area here. And again, since I'm using a, a soft kneaded eraser, I'm going to end up with a soft edge with a transition instead of making like a solid white line that goes across. So next, what I want to do is clean out the red from the airbrush, I think. And then uh, actually, I need a little bit of red in here. So let me do that real quick. Let's switch back over to here. And part of where, uh, how I'm plotting colors, you're selecting what needs to have more of what, is just uh, somewhat experience and just going to know how light is going to work and how it's going to move across surfaces. Um, doesn't mean I always get it right, but sometimes in the nature, in the process of doing these, you you see the push and pull and go, okay, I put this down, now this needs to be pulled back, or I put this down, so now all these other areas have to be adjusted to balance, which is why I don't normally jump into black right away, because on a white page, as soon as you put down black, you've created this high contrast thing that you need to fill in all the balance for versus starting from something that has medium tones that slowly get brighter and slowly get darker. Um, for me, the system, the process is a little bit more manageable this way. All right, so I'm gonna clean the red out of the airbrush and switch over to a black that I have mixed up. So bear with me just a moment here. <laughs> Hi, Tune. He says hello, or, or she. Uh, hello, wow, that's cool. Hi there. <laughs> I like that name, Tune. That's a cool name. That is a cool name. Where yeah. is Tune watching from? Oh. Hard to say. Or Robert, where are you from? Or Roberto, sorry. All right, so. Just cleaning up, uh, cleaning out the red from the airbrush so that I can jump into the black. And uh, that will be a color that I can use as an overlay for everything. 
Um, which will make more sense. I've said it out loud, and it makes no sense now that I said it out loud. <laughs> but it'll make more sense when I'm doing it. So just for reference here, I've got two different blacks mixed. I've got just straight black that's reduced, and then I've got a black here that's actually got some blue in it. And they're going to serve a slightly different purpose. But I'm going to start with what I would consider the warmer or more neutral black first. And again, it's just Createx illustration paints. Um, shadows and light operate in both warm and cool. So depending on the surface you're rendering, one will be warmer and one will be cooler. It just looks a little more natural that way. You can kind of ballpark it and land in the middle somewhere. Um, but I like the variation. It helps things look a certain way. Like good, bad, or indifferent. So just making sure that I'm no longer shooting red through the airbrush. A quick little test, of course, on a scrap piece of paper. Yeah, sometimes in demos, I'll, I'll like mark up this entire corner with markers and airbrush. And then later someone's like, how much for that drawing that I ruined in the process of demoing? But what? Whoops. Whatever <laughs> I just dropped. Hopefully it didn't go too far. Oh, there it is. Hang on. <laughs> You got it. You got it. Okay. Good, good, good. The airbrush cap. All right. So this being the warmer black, what I'm going to start with is going over some of the gray tones to start to bring those down a bit. And this is where I'm going to start to balance the contrast of everything. And some of these will end up with the blue black over it as well, or I'll just shoot a little bit more blue over it. I just want to start to just want to start to balance the image a little bit. And actually, from this example, I feel like I did a pretty good job with the red in a core way. So I don't need to go too crazy with it. I want a little bit because I don't want any of the image to feel disjointed. Or like I put some attention in some area and not in the others. So run the bottom edge there and just start to run over the shadow. I'm going to be careful at this point and go around the wheels a little bit. which I'll come back into later. I want to start to balance the marker a little bit and create a little bit more of an open shadow. And maybe clean up some of the marker streaking. Again, trying to be patient and deliberate at the same time. I want to, I want to cover these areas and I want to transition them quickly, but I need to be mindful that it's marker paper and it's only going to take with so much abuse before it starts to war for or shrink her otherwise. So as much as I just want to jam on and throw some color on it, you need to be careful, you need to be patient, make sure that they don't overdo it all at once. Plus it's a nice way to kind of keep an eye on values. It's very easy to accidentally put too much tone or color or ink whenever you're working with too much down too quick. Um, and in this way, you can just kind of build it and kind of keep an eye on it as it's going. Now, it probably doesn't show up super great on the uh, on the demo. I'm looking at the live feed over here on my monitor, and it looks 10,000% different. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, I wonder what it looks like on the TV. Good question. I don't know if it would be better or worse. I don't know. All good questions. So, since I deliberately didn't use black ink early on, now I can use the black paint in the way that I would without leaving any harsh lines behind because everything is going to this airbrush is going to be a little bit more natural a little bit more organic looking so of course i want to hit some of these under areas that are out of light which i'll probably highlight later anyways just go over this body area a little bit i want a little bit of saturation in there just for the sake of fun um, again just don't want to get too heavy handed this stage because it, it can start to look unnatural I'm going to bend some of the rules for lighting, but not all of them. Um, actually, that's pretty not bad for right where that's at. Go a little bit heavier in the core area there. You know, almost all shadows have some transition to them. It's going to be the darkest, darkest area, and they're slowly going to bring out the something. Obviously, an airbrush transition will be a lot cleaner than this, uh, than these marker streaks, but I like the marker streaks in a composition like this. Because then the way that I've done the color reflections that have some of these broken zigzag lines, the way that I've done the glass, they all feel relative to each other um, as opposed to being disjointed, which sometimes illustrations can be. 
So, I still got the warm black. I'm going to go over this grill area real quick and just kind of tone it down. So now that I've worked these darker areas to where I think I want them to be, I want to make sure that I'm going over the other marker areas and at least getting the tone or the value in the same ballpark so that they, didn't sit, they don't stand out like I did them in a different way. Got to be a little bit of shadow. And again, I'm going to bend some rules here for sure. But usually it's in the name of trying to do something more fun looking than real life. They certainly don't consider what I do to be photorealism. But some level of reality is certainly acceptable. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah, yeah, we're in a little bit of a balance. Something that's more illustrative and fun than real life, but not overly comic y, but, you know, somewhere in the middle, for sure. So, next, since I've still got this particular shade of blackout, I'm going to go over the wheel areas a little bit and start to transition those in a way, to me, this is a little bit more manageable with the airbrush. Um, and I've still got my big pen sketch, so it's not like I'm overly burying anything. And it'll start to bring the colors all into the same family. And you notice I didn't do the hoops yet, because I'm going to do those with a different, uh, different grip. But I can still see the big pen through this, so I know exactly what I need to pull, uh, or how I can shape the details coming into it. Or, you know, towards the end. All right, so well, black airbrush, or this particular shade of black airbrush, we're good. I'm going to switch over to the cool black now, and I'll start to transition in these glass areas as they're going towards the upper cooler areas. So bear with me a moment. I'm going to switch colors here. Hopefully not break anything. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. <laughs> no, just making noises. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind me. I'm going to ask your opinion on, on something when we're done. Okay. It's a good idea. Well, there are so many. So many. So many things that I, I don't know what to choose. As far as? As far as hair. Ah, ah. Getting the haircut, I see. Yeah. I understand what you're saying now. All right. I want to get cut, but I'm not sure I can pull off some of these styles. Sometimes you never know. Yeah. The real haircut was inside us the whole time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anyway. It's sort of true. All right. So we've got the cooler black mixed up. I'm going to test it and know the airbrush isn't going to freak out. I can start to transition the rest of the areas the way that I have in my mind. So I normally will say glass is a great example for cooler gray, because somehow when I'm using the warmer gray, it might seem really obvious that the glass can look really, really dirty, which is also really unnatural. <laughs> I mean, I'm not really wasting too much time with details on the interior there. Um, really more for the sake of demo. Sometimes in a more involved drawing, I'll put little Little hints of the interior, but for what we're doing today, we just we want to show a little bit of everything without spending too much time in one area or another. So carefully trying to stay within the glass edge here. There's going to be a little bit of overspray into these transition areas, and they'll get cleaned up towards the end. Well, we're definitely getting towards the end, but um, with a different set of tools. All right, so we got some some clean transition going in there. We'll do the same thing in the black glass, the back glass. So I'm trying not to hit my face on the camera. Yeah, it's right there, so close. I'm just trying to be mindful of putting small amounts of paint down, so I'm not warping the. Paint. And of course, being cautious of the edges. I don't want. To, I just don't want to throw paint down everywhere because then I'll have a lot more cleanup to do at the end. And with the least amount of cleanup to do at the end, there'll always be some. But I just don't want to make my. I don't want to have to work any harder for the end result. So now I'm kind of going back over a bit of what was there, 
so I can have a little bit of the cool and a little bit of the warm. So the glass doesn't appear dirty, but I don't necessarily want to have it all cool either. And the, the color temperature might not show up so much um, on the camera. It doesn't look that much different on my computer monitor over here, but win some, lose some. It matters to me. All right, so while I'm here, I can maybe hit these edges just a little bit. The airbrush is cooperating, so I can get into some of these detail areas a little bit better. Maybe like camera, uh, mirror drop shadow be a little bit more intense off the back end here because it's in shadow. We'll give that a little bit more depth as it's going towards the core color here. Same with this mirror. Oftentimes, black with a little bit of tone in it, like blue, for example, will just give the shading another character that's a little bit more natural than, say, this um, uh, black straight with reducer. It's just a little bit dirty looking, which isn't too bad as long as you're using it deliberately. So this little filler area in here. Let's do all this with the airbrush. Just try to be really careful about staying where it needs to be. And then also not over applying paint so that I don't warp this tiny little area. But today the airbrush is in a good mood. So far the airbrush is in a good mood. <laughs> Some things are starting to look more balanced, but now we need to, you know, the stage is coming up, we'll have to balance the cloniness of the edges, which is where things start to get really crisp again, which is nice. It's very nice. So I'm going to hit the inside of the um, headlights just a little bit. There'll be a little bit more paint detail on them to bring them back up. But again, at this stage, I want to make sure that I've got the color temperatures, which might not be showing up on camera. I want those to be a little bit more, um, feel like they're all from the same family. And because I have these really, really dark marker areas here, I can, I don't want to say be careless, but the overspray is going in these capture areas where it's negligent. I don't really have to worry about you know, dark airbrush paint going into a dark area. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Just really carefully working the, um, the shape of the wheels there. Some of that shots I'll do, or some of the, the detail I'll do in uh, what I call recovery, bringing some of the details back after I painted them down. But that's just all part of the fun, especially when I'm not doing any masking. If I was masking these, everything would look a lot sharper and a lot more deliberate in a single pass. But for the sake of demo, we want to keep things moving along here. We'll do that another time. Just excited that my airbrush isn't mad at me today. Basically got those where I want as far as the tone and the values. Everything is starting to look really balanced from here, which is nice, at least from the stage where I'm at. So the next thing to focus on, correcting some of the edges, you know, some of the seams. Those are details that start to help things come to life a little bit. So see at this stage, what I want to do is I'm going to go over a little bit of the gray again, the warm gray, with a little bit of the cool so that it has a little bit of a transition area. It might not show up on camera, but as a as an illustration overall, feel better knowing that these areas work. All right, really good about that. So I'm gonna clean out this color from the airbrush and I'm gonna switch over to a different set of tools once I get the paint out of here. How are you doing over there, Miss Lady? There's too many choices. So many choices, so many haircuts. You know, hair grows back. I know hair grows back. <laughs> you can always do all the haircuts you ever want. Every single one. I just, I don't know if I just want like a trim, just to like fix my bob, or uh, a little shorter. All good questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you when you're done. Yeah, you I don't want to distract you while you're painting. Oh, that's all good. You got a little time to make some decisions. Mm -hmm. 
hastily clean the airbrush so that we can jump into the next stage here. So, usually you have, keep a brush on hand so I can kick any dust off so I'm not dragging my hand through the artwork over and over again. And just like with the red, I'm going to use the eraser to pull back some of the airbrushing from the edges. Again, not totally sure how much of this is even going to show up in camera, but, you know, I'm treating this just like I would do it for me versus if I was doing it for a demo. <laughs> The nice thing about being able to do the subtractive highlights is you can get kind of these soft edges out of the subtraction, which is really, really nice. Which you could do, you know, I can do with a pencil or paint, which a lot of times I do, but the material is designed to do it, let's just do it. Like that for too long. All right, so let's see from here, we're going to switch over to pencils. Yay, pencils! Pencils! All right, once I dig up all the stuff that I'm going to use anyways, so I'm going to take the sheet down here and kind of explain how I work with some of the pencils. Once I find them. Try to keep everything right next to the desk so they don't have to search around too much, but sometimes I fly through materials and I'll put them back as carefully as I should. So at this point, I'm just going to use some basic black and whites because I want to start to define some of these edges. And, um, and there's not a lot of color shift that happens in the details of some of these things. So working just monochromatic on details really doesn't hurt anything, especially with cars. So, but there'll be examples down the road that are better suited for different colors. So the way I like to do these, which I'm sure plenty of people do, is after I sharpen it a little bit, I use a piece of sandpaper and get the edge just a little sharper. I wouldn't be able to get the edge that sharp in this pencil sharpener or some other pencil sharpener, so I just keep sandpaper around so that I can do it by hand. And from this stage, I might grab some of these tools handy. Some of these... Um, French curves and, and ship curves, sorry, um, so that I can do these lines in one pass. I could absolutely do them freehand, or I could just do that real quick. You know, no point in making yourself work any harder. Well, Roberto wants to know if, if you're using a normal eraser or using one with a battery. Ah, an electric eraser. The one that looks like a pen. Yeah. The, let me grab it because it's uh, the short answer is just a normal eraser, just a white vinyl eraser. But um, electric erasers can be great if you want to add texture in the subtractive way. But because most of what I do is automotive, there's very little room for texture as a as a feature. So it's just a normal eraser, at least in the world of erasers. <laughs> could use my rainbow one. I could have, but we didn't. Yeah. So much. So these little detail areas, um, I'm not looking at a reference. I'm not worried about, uh, you know, overly sticking to a reference for accuracy or anything like that. I've done a million illustrations, so I know from practice what I like to highlight and what I don't like to highlight. And these types of detail edges, like around the glass, because we'll normally have like a chrome trim, or in the case of a car like this, the weather stripping. Um, so to bring that out a little bit as a defined edge, especially over the airbrushing, really starts to make it look a little bit more defined. So throw one of these guys around until I feel like I've got something close to what I'm looking for. Flip it around and meet the edge. I don't necessarily want to just chase every single outline especially with such a direct light source, because it'll start to look a little unnatural. I am going to highlight things that would otherwise not be highlighted for the sake of just being able to see the details more clearly, because I don't want to just bury everything in shadow. That's why I say I'm going to bend some of the rules here. But that's OK. And just going back and forth with the sandpaper to keep it sharp. 
and I'm just gonna keep running around some of these edges to bring them up. Do, 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 do. I realize this is a lot like watching paint dry, but well, paint is dry. Paint is dry. But these are the detail areas that's gonna start to make a little bit more life since we've done a good job of making lots of shapes and colors out of marker and then burying all those with some airbrush. Now we need to start to bring the details back. And I don't want to overdo it, especially you know in an area like this that's in shadow. I want to be able to see the edges of some of these things, which again, if I was masking, a lot of that stuff would just naturally stay clean and sharp. But sometimes it can look a little bit unnatural. So let's see what else, what else? So some of these I'll do, and I'll start to pull part of this hand, area freehand, just because it'd be a little bit faster than trying to find a curve for it. And then using a curve where it makes sense. Just part of the area. Look at this one. I grab a little bit of black and start to correct the area a little bit. You know, this is the caveat of working freehand. Sometimes things are going to be spot on and sometimes they're not. But I think things can look a little bit more natural if they're mixed with some freehand. And sometimes this stage is edge correction and sometimes it's placement of details. So if I got some marker that I got a little bit carried away with, you know, this stage is a good time to start to bring all that stuff back. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. So there actually isn't a ton of line detail on this, which is good. It's actually a, a 911 Zero, pretty simplistic car. And I know which details I'm going to want to do in paint once all this is wrapped up. And I know which ones I'm going to want to do. And Roberto is from Portugal. Oh, nice. And he's been a fan of yours for a long time. And he actually started illustrating and kind of copying and catting you on your art. Nice. Well, that's really cool. I'm excited that you came by. There's plenty of artists that I've been influenced by, so I get it. That's how you learn it. What's your style? And you, you take it from someone that that you really admire, and you try and, and do your best to do the same as them. I think so. Get your own yeah. thing. There's so many artists that I've enjoyed um, while I've been on my own journey and still many many artists i look up to thank you roberto yes thank you and thank you for coming by right, while i'm here i've got a little bit of marker that's slightly out of perspective for what i have in mind as the end result so i'm just gonna hit that with a little bit of pencil to clean it up i'll be able to clean it up a little bit more with some paint towards the end but again kind of like the difference with marker and airbrush, marker being the hard shape tool and airbrush being the soft shape tool. I'll use the pencil for some of the softer cleaning up. And then at the very, very end, which is right after this, I'll use the paint and a brush to do the hard lines and final details. And trying to meter each stage a little bit as well. I don't want to overdo any one area more than another. Like everything that I'm going to do in pencil, if I just go over it again with paint, I might as well have just done it in paint. Um, so try not to waste any time in an area that doesn't need to be or a stage that's going to be done later in a different way or whatever that is. Well, there's still a lot of my original sketch showing through, which is pretty common with um, with Big Pen because it's going to bleed through a little bit. But one of the reasons I like Big Pen, I specifically sketch in blue because somehow it looks a little bit more natural in the end versus black. If I did heavy outlines in black to start with, things can kind of take a comic booky look right away just because that's what comic book illustration is about really careful line work and heavy use of black and I want some of that but I don't want all of it which is where I think the blue looks a little bit more natural
Alright. So just got a few more things to go over with in the white area. Just kind of picking some edges to define or highlight while I'm bending the rules here. And thankfully, because I'm working in pencil, if I get a little bit carried away, I can just hit it with an eraser real quick. As long as I'm being careful and not trying, don't want to over subtract any of the um, in the airbrush that I put on. So I just got to be careful. Sounds like the dogs are getting concerned out there. They've been good. I, I hope they, they stay good. Yeah, that would be nice. No. You sharpen the pencil up a little bit more. There won't be a whole lot of detail areas to do with this one in black because because of the way that so much of it's already been done. And because the big pen is showing through so much, I won't have to spend as much time with those details, which is nice. So I can just uh, take my time to peck a little bit more on these, on the uh, the soft highlights is what they would be considered. Just showing some of the edging a little bit. <laughs> and at this point, I can start to work the area where I know I'm going to do a highlight in the glass. I can start with pencil so that it has some some softness on the outside edge, which I can do with paint because I'm going to use a gouache or an acrylic and I can soften the edge. But being able to start with pencil gives me a little bit more predictability at the start. Um, and I often, you know, I'm not, I'm making up the lighting source as I go. And as I've said a few times, bending some rules. But, um, being able to put it in with pencil first means I can go over some of the areas with um, with paint later or leave more of the pencil so that I have some of these soft lines mixed with some of the hard lines. And just a bit of practice and experiences help me figure out what I can get away with. Well, not always true, you know, sometimes it works. And I'll do the same thing on the side glass here, even though it's not going to be a huge reflection because it's in shadow. I'm still going to bend enough of the rules to create some contrast and to split up the, uh, the marker and the airbrush that I have going on. And I want all these lighting rules, even the ones that I'm breaking, to follow the same contour. So this highlight I'm going to want to run all the way through as much as possible. Yay! <laughs> it happens. <laughs> All right, so from here, well, this stuff is looking good so far. Everything's balancing really, really well. So let's see, I could maybe take a little bit of black and just in the core area, create a little bit of contrast in the lights, just so that we're balancing everything a little bit. And kind of creating a detailed area, point of focus. And of course, it's always back and evaluate, make sure everything's actually going the way that it needs to and nothing's getting out of hand. So, you know, always keep a fresh set of eyes on everything. Make sure it's not, nothing's getting away from you. All right, let's see. And transition that area just a little bit. You know, everything, the early start to early stages are a little bit more free and a little bit more quick. And at this point, really, really want to slow down and be a lot more deliberate. So, so because the details being put in the right places are not or not being done haphazardly make the details look more and less believable so we don't want to you don't want to rush through this part so i'm just going to highlight a little bit of the door edge there not all of it every detail has to be done with some balance and consideration you don't want to just 
rerun all the lines that you already did. You don't want to make any more fatness in the lines that already exist. So just being deliberate about how as well. So let me see this little area here. I want a little bit of highlight. I don't want a ton. And it's a line that I definitely only want to have to pull one time. So I'm going to grab a, a curve to hit it just a little bit. Because it's a detail that will show just enough definition to start to make things look a little bit more realistic. Which I don't want to overdo, but I don't want to neglect either. All right, so with where I'm at, let's see. Switching back and forth between some pencils. Clean up some of these marker edges or, you know, use a smaller white pencil to define just some of these upper details a little bit better. And let's see. So, and then just kind of step back and start to evaluate. What's that? <laughs> What's Lucia at the bar? What'd she do? <laughs> I'm uh, making Velociraptor noise. Biggest brother. And she's just so sad. Because she misses you. It's a dog sigh. So sad. And she knows we're talking. Does not know. Does she not know? She knows, she knows not. not. <laughs> Yeah, try to also, every time I use pencil, use the brush to kind of kick off the extra dust because it can be pretty easy to take the wrist and smear it in there accidentally. And yeah, we don't want that. The least amount of that is possible. So while I'm here, I'm going to edge in a little bit of the headlight bezels. I did in a Because that, that's not believable. Then it just looks like I'm outlining stuff. I want to be deliberate about what I'm picking as a detail um, and just transitioning the edges so that it doesn't look like I'm just outlining every single little thing. If I was doing something that was going to be a little more comic booky, I would outline everything deliberately. But in this setting, I want to be careful about balancing my idea of looking illustrative and a little bit of realism for the sake of what a rendering would be not going too far in either direction. So I'm just going to use pencil to clean up some of these other edges real quick. And then um, the next thing will be to get into the wheels. And we're actually not too far from wrapping this one. So because the wheels, I'm going to do the spokes in kind of a satiny, satiny black. It's going to give me a lot of room for not overemphasizing detail. It's my, for the sake of demo, it's a nice way to kind of jam through. You have to be polished and take a different approach, but just to kind of keep this moving along, I'm going to do this as more of a, more of a satin black type of wheel. So just like with the other details, I don't want to just outline everything, even though it might seem like that's what I'm doing. Um, I want to outline what will be considered the upper surfaces so that we can make shape at the same time as defining the details. Um, because just outlining everything will just, it will define it, but not in the same way. And in the case of like a satin black wheel or something like that, there's there's very little detail. The detail is in the highlight, which is why I wasn't really concerned about overdoing airbrushing or marker over top of this, uh, over top of the wheel outlines, because I just know from experience that the way to make these believable will be in the way that the highlights are done, not in the way that the color is done. And we just need to go around everything just enough to define the shape or that there's a difference between the upper section or the lower section, whatever that is, a little bit of outline will be okay. Just don't want to get really heavy handed because it'll start to take on the wrong look. 
fly detail, I guess is the, is the best way to put that without getting too, too carried away. And at the same time, imply which direction the shape is going. Sorry, just <laughs> relaxing my fingers a little bit there. And uh, what I'm imagining here is a bit more of a fuchs style wheel. So I can uh, color in the cutouts, the, uh, the open parts of the wheels, and at the same time, really carefully just use the black pencil lightly to correct some of the tire shape. And I'll do the same thing with the wheel shape. Once I get back to the um, once I get back to the uh, white marker or white pencil, sorry. Oh, the dogs are panicking. All right, so let's see. I just really carefully kind of pick out the dark areas in here. Uh, at this point, I'm sort of doing it from memory. I've done a bunch of these wheels, so I have an idea where they should go without looking at any reference or anything like that. And in the case, even though it's a black wheel, the darkest part is still going to be what's behind the wheel. And it's not going to be a, a super obvious detail because it's a black wheel. So it doesn't have to be overdone, but implied correctly, at least for the sake of what I'm doing here. <laughs> it's so dramatic. <laughs> cool, cool. All right, so that's pretty much where I need that to be. I mean, I can, can highlight a little bit of the window area. It's not totally necessary, and it can start to become a little over-detailed but a little bit fine. Just so that we can apply, imply that something is there. But that's why I like to keep the pencil sharp with the sandpaper so that I can work the little details without accidentally over fattening them up. So I'll do the same thing on the back. Just kind of hit the cutout areas, which are pretty well buried because of the perspective of the wheel anyways. And running the edges, just like it did in the other one. Sorry, sorry. And there really isn't a whole lot to emphasize with shape in this one, because the perspective really buries the wheel a bit. And um, it's a black wheel with black cutouts, so there isn't a whole lot to it. And I'm illustrating stuff like this. I'm looking for what I can simplify, what I can leave out. Um, and something I see oftentimes is just stuff that's detailed to death. And I don't always think that it looks good. Sometimes it works, but it's not always a compliment for the art to have just to be overly busy without like a rhyme or reason. <laughs> if everything's busy, it's kind of okay. It kind of helps justify itself. But if you're just over busy in an area because you have a good reference for that wheel, so you just kill the wheel with lines and stuff. That just seems like overkill to me. And again, because uh, the wheel that I'm imagining here, like a satiny black fuke, it's going to be, it's not going to have a lot of detail in real life when you first look at it anyway. So over detailing it will change the color and the look of the composition anyways. So with enough practice, you can figure out where to let detail fall naturally and where to stop putting detail. All right, let's see. All right, so I'm going to switch back to the other white pencil real quick. I'm going to try to get back some of this wheel shape really carefully with pencil. I could take some ellipses and run them around at the same time um, to get something that's a bit more accurate, but this, this particular shape is pretty simple, so it should be pretty easy to do by hand. And I don't want to over-highlight it. What I essentially want to do is split up the difference between what I've airbrushed and what I've markered so that the dish feels different than the lip. Even though they're both in shadow, there should be some difference between the two, and that helps define what shape is for these areas. And then I can even start to just highlight this area, even though it's uh, it already started to highlight it with, uh, with the eraser. 
I can build up a little bit more pencil on that area to start to make this area to be a little bit more brighter and deliberate. Let me back and do the same thing in the upper area. Since I already know that's kind of where I'm going to put my highlights. Sharpen this guy up one more time. That will really be just about time to jump into the paint details, which are the last little bits that kind of help highlight the shapes and define everything. So, try not to hit my face on the camera. In a slower setting, I would probably grab a gray pencil specifically or paint and repaint the rims, the outer part of the rim in a gray in a value that made sense versus doing it in pencil the way I am. But this would be a good example of if I'm out at a shop and I'm doing something that needs to be done rather quickly, I'm going to use the tools that will get me to the best end result with the least amount of working time. But if I'm going to sit down and do a really nice illustration for somebody, I'm going to be mixing up a lot more paints and painting over a lot of this one little piece at a time to really, really help over to find the details. That's where getting a little bit busy with details can sort of justify itself if you're balancing everything with details. If you're just over detailing one area, you're, it will sort of read that way. But uh, inherently, because pencil has a little bit of graininess to it, on um, some of the stuff that I want to slow down and do better details with, I'll maybe I'll do all this in pencil and I'll still come back over with paint to um, to smooth it out. But all about the end result that you're after and how much time that you have to spend on something. And I'm just starting to plot the highlights that I know I'm going to put in towards the end, which we are nearing. I want to have just a little bit of highlight on the tire, or at least I want to test drive the look of a highlight on the tire. I can change my mind a little bit and pull it back with some eraser. But again, even though that kind of breaks the rules of where the light is, I want to help split up some of these areas that I've more or less deliberately buried with ink and paint. And I think it can make for a nice detail. All right, all right. So I'm just going to grab a red pencil real quick. There's a couple areas that I'm like, hmm, I can clean this up with some, with some red real quick before we jump into paint. And in most of these illustrations, I'm doing marker, then airbrush, then pencil. So this is pretty normal as far as mixing mediums to come up with an end result. I never use one thing to do everything. I never really understood why people did. All right, so we're in a good spot. Again, just kind of looking at everything, making sure everything's balanced, at least for the look that I'm after. You know, I might just hit a little highlight in this tire area here, just teensy tiny. I hear doggos. They want us to come out. I know. We're getting there. So close. All right. They're excited. So excited. I don't know if they see friends outside. Maybe. Doggo friends? Doggo friends. <gasps> They're gone. I don't know where you are. Doggos are getting excited. Right. 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 Don't know. Making noise. <laughs> I'm just going to correct a couple of these edges before I get into paint so that I don't have to paint correct them. I can just kind of work them in this way that I've already got the tool in my hand, essentially, so I'm just going to go ahead for it. All right, so a really good balance of everything so far. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the paint. So I'm going to use white paint to do some of these highlights and wrap this guy up. And I always say that and go, oh, wait, there's an area there. Oh, wait, there's an area there. Pretty easy to, to get carried away with these and just kind of go forever. But that's exactly what I'm doing. All right. <laughs> All right. So at the same time that I'm getting ready for the next stage, I'm also going to clear off my desk of 
pencils and markers so that I can just focus on the very last tool. One last thing that I'm going to do. So I'm going to move all this stuff over to a different desk. Bang, except that thing. Again, just kind of look at everything and evaluate, make sure it's all going well enough. Which I think it's going really good, actually. So, yeah. So now I'm going to mix up some paint. And let's see what I do. Okay. A lot of times for stuff like this, I'll use the uh, whole, or yeah, these are whole paint, acrylic wash. Just like the way that they work for the process, especially for the finished work, it just adds a really nice polished look to what I'm after. So I'm gonna mix up the paint a little bit. I'm gonna grab a little cup, add some water, bring out some brushes, and start doing these last little bits of detail. And this is something I would definitely consider in the realm of pretty quick. We're an hour and 30 in, and they're down to final highlights, which is nice. If I was going to spend all day on a rendering, and sometimes I do, you know, there's masking, there's a lot more paint work to the finish. Um, but I think this works as a really good demo example of something we can accomplish pretty quickly. So, let's see, I got a cup of water here that I'm going to carefully try not to spill all over the place. Not enough water. Oh, let's go and put this guy down. And take the same little cup or different cup similar and add some white paint to it. And I'll just add to the outside edges like that because of the way that I'm going to palette it inside of that. So, so I have my marker paper taped down to a full pad of paper. So thankfully this thing has just enough mass that as I'm dragging my hand across it, I shouldn't it shouldn't disturb it too much, you know, because if you're pulling long lines and then the paper binds, uh, you can get like a kink, and then uh, all of a sudden it doesn't look like a single pass line anymore. And that's more or less what I'm after, lines that look like they were done one time. So I've got a little bit of water, so just mixing a little bit of water with the paint and just palleting on the inside of the cup. And this will probably be enough for everything because of the perspective. There isn't like a ton of highlight detail that needs to happen. And I already like how everything looks already. So I'm not going to need to get overly carried away. I just want to clean up some of these outside edges. And I kind of keep going back and forth between water and paint until I get um, a flow I like for the coverage that I'm after. And you can too. And part of why I like don't mind the overspray on the outside edge is because when I'm doing this final outline highlight, it makes that edge look a little bit firmer and a little bit brighter than if I just masked everything. It's a different look, but you know, to each their own. Because obviously the majority of the light is coming in from this direction, I don't need to get uh, overly carried away. And because it's wash, I should be able to pull some of this out and move it around a little bit. All right, let's see what else. There aren't going to be a ton of heavy highlights on this one. Did a pretty good job deliberately going around everything with pencil. There's a few things that I wanted to find a little bit harder. Some, for me, it's a little bit easier. Again, because gouache, I can just kind of wet the brush a little bit and bring that area out. You got to be careful because it's marked paper, so it's a it's not going to take a whole lot of abuse with water before it finally gives up and says, no more. I can't take it. So I've got to be careful and deliberate. And each stage a little bit slower than the last one so that we can take a little bit more time to think about the decisions that are each of the stages.
up a type of detail. Again, I don't necessarily want to run over every single line that I've done. In some cases, I will, and then it'll seem like, why are we redoing that area? We already did it. Because um, the whole thing to me is a bit of a balancing act. You know, now this area is sharp, we need to soften this. And now this area is soft, we need to sharpen this. So it's just a little bit of everything. It can be a lot of back and forth, especially, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not, I'm not using a photo reference. I almost never do. Um, in terms of lighting, I never do. Because I'm not just going to reproduce what lighting looks like from somebody else's photo for a million different reasons. So just kind of going back and forth between mixing a little bit of water in with the paint that I've already got going so I can keep the flow and the line weight balanced based on what I'm after as an end result here. And then grabbing a wet paintbrush to trail these ends off a little bit more cleanly. All right, what else? There actually there isn't really going to be a ton on this because of the really harsh directional lighting. But I'm going to overemphasize some areas just for the sake of being illustrative. And it's always important to know exactly where your light source is coming from. Otherwise, it's just going to look wonky. Yeah, it can get really strange if you have an unbalanced light source. And, you know, as I've said a million times, I'm breaking a lot of rules with this one as far as the way light sources and highlights work. But... Um, with good knowledge of the fundamentals and the rules, you can figure out how to break them better. But that's one huge reason I don't usually ever rely on somebody else's photos as a as a way to shape light source because somebody's taking photos outside or or something like that where there's a million different light sources. And to me, it seems really obvious, but to somebody else, it might seem fine. And that type of over detail is a little bit aggravating to me. So I don't do it. All right. It's always funny when you see uh, renderings that are done by other people and the reflections they do are like the reflections that were in the photo yeah. but aren't in the uh, actual rendering. Yeah, I find that to be a little bit unusual. I mean, to each their own for sure, but it's, it's not a method that really makes much sense to me. I'm not, gonna, I'm not just going to replicate somebody's photo that they sent me. Anybody can do that. Um, quote unquote, anybody could do that. I, uh, if I'm going to do a piece of artwork for somebody, I'm going to make it something that doesn't exist already. Otherwise, what's the point? But again, to each their own. Everybody has a different thing that they're after. This is true. Just kind of running some wide lines around the outside edge. This is part of why I like a little bit of overspray so that this this uh, this outline can seem a little bit more like a shine line or a direct direct light line, something that helps sharpen up that edge a little bit. And it's one of the illustrative things that definitely breaks the rules of realism, but I like a nice white outline towards the outside edge there. It also starts to bring the focus in a little bit more. And in most circumstances, I probably would have gotten a little bit lighter on my pen sketch. So, because there's a lot of it showing through. Thankfully, this color, everything kind of worked out so it doesn't look terrible together. Win some, lose some for sure. But um, normally, I'd probably go a little bit lighter on it so I didn't have so much of the show through. But in a demo, I want to make sure I've got a really bold outline so you guys can kind of see what I started with and what I finished with. Now I'm starting to make some decisions about what needs to be deliberately highlighted, what needs a little bit more shape. And there'll be a little bit of back and forth here. But certainly nearing the end stages as well. 
the highlights to me are usually the very, very last thing, which sort of makes sense. They should stand it above everything. Yeah. But I've certainly seen other artists that work in, in different ways and that, that makes sense to them. But this is definitely the way, the order of things that makes sense to me. So the thing I mentioned earlier that I put a lot of gray down and allowed a lot of overs overspray into the headlight areas specifically so that I could paint in some highlights so it could create some contrast. Paper is already naturally white. So putting white highlights over paper really isn't going to show very much. So you need some level of contrast. So maybe slightly putting too much tone or a little bit more value than is necessary will create these areas where there's possibility to create a little bit more highlight and it looks a little bit more dramatic. All right, it's kind of looking at everything, evaluating, seeing what needs what. Everything's looking really good. There's only a few areas that I'm even going to add anything to. I want to make sure my shapes aren't getting out of control. Mm, yeah, so I'm going to take and start doing a couple of little highlights just because of the size brush I already have in my hand. So we can start to just build out the detail edges a little bit and define that it's it's a glossy surface versus a uh, a satin or matte surface because they oftentimes can read very very similar if the details aren't quite balanced correctly you want some really harsh highlights and stuff especially in the case of something that's glossy all right let's see so i'm just kind of looking around evaluating what needs what because this one actually balanced really, really good and clean without the need to jump around a whole lot, which is nice. It's going to make this last stage a lot faster. But some, some go faster and some don't. That's okay. And I certainly want to be really delicate on this side of the shadow where highlights are because there technically shouldn't be any highlights, but I'm more or less doing it for the sake of drama at least visually, it just makes things a little bit more interesting, as long as it's done deliberately and with some sense of how things work. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. All right. So now... And just have a couple little detail areas in the wheels before I break into the last detail pen, uh, paint brush. I'm just thinning down the paint a little bit more to get the um, to get the edge just a little bit firmer here. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of highlight in these areas, and then use a wet paint brush to blend that out real quick. I just went a little bit. Just to define that those areas exist. And we had already done that at an earlier stage. Again, as I mentioned before, it's kind of this balancing act. As you start to add to one thing, something else stands out. So just kind of helping bring everything around. Just going back and forth between paint brushes here. And that's probably good for those areas. I'm going to run the wheel rim just a little bit with some really, really thinned out paint just to help those stand out a little bit more. I'm trying to think of other things to talk to you about. <laughs> What happened? No, just my brain. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a long weekend. Uh, just, just a late night. Yeah. 
I don't like working that late. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really nice drive back last night, although it was late. But it was a nice drive. It was not, it's unusual for you on a Sunday anyways. This is true. It seems like it would be normal, but it's not. It's totally not. I would be drawing or painting no matter what, so this doesn't like, this isn't unusual. We wouldn't try to set up for something so deliberately on a weekend, though. I'm sorry. Would it be better to, to do stuff during the week, do you think? Yeah. It's really hard to say. I think we had to put that one to a vote. Yeah. I would think for other people to, to watch, it will be easier during the weekend since people are home, but, you know. To ask other people what they think. I'm wondering if a lot of people, if they like, would look during their work week, like they just need something on the background. Yeah. Or, um, or if they're like us and they just do all their YouTubing at night, just, just to catch up on everything. It's possible. Oh, my doggies. <laughs> We're almost done here, so. Yeah, they just want attention. They they don't like being left out. They're not exactly friendly for this type of camera setup. Nope. Yeah, stuff yeah. Time. really get a little bit more elaborate with this one as far as setting up a camera. But it's almost done. We're almost there. These last little odds and ends before we all just go with our lives. <laughs> All right, yeah, we don't really need too much in there, so this is going to be a couple little details, and I'm just going to overwet some of this paint because even just a really, really reduced white paint is still going to give way more of a highlight with very little effort. So, so I'll come back with a little bit of this paintbrush. It just has water in it. Kind of soften up some of these things because we want to imply these details, but we don't want to overdo them, which I'm very much on the borderline of doing. Yeah, I think that works for that. I'm going to pull back a little bit of what I have here, a little bit of pencil. There we go, that works. I'll take it. <laughs> All right, and then. So I'm going to clean out this brush, and I just have one more that I'm going to use for some of these big final highlights. And then we're done. It's so pretty. Yeah, it's so pretty. I hope it looks cool on the uh, on uh, what you're looking at. It looks pretty cool from here, but it stuff always looks so different <laughs> than yeah. I think that it would. All right, so switch over to a fatter brush. Some of these fatter final highlights on this one, just because of the direction I have of light, I'm probably gonna, you know, continue to break some rules. But. but that's because that's how I roll. You're rebel. So rebellious. And these types of highlights are just really kind of bring everything together towards the end, I think. But everything starts out pretty soft, and then things are going to get a little bit sharper back towards the end as we're outlining things and defining things a bit more. And also shows the, the shine yeah. of the vehicle. Exactly, exactly. Very good point. Otherwise, it just looks flat and bland. Yeah. Which is pretty easy to accidentally do. <laughs> so I'm going to go over these arches just a little bit. That might not technically be accurate. 
just want a little bit more harshness in the way that these are shaped. Nice, perfect. Cool. So I just got a few more little dollops here. Done. So I try to keep the highlights pretty linear so that they feel like they have uh, more of a deliberate flow, even if they're wrong. <laughs> just by them at least being in the same direction, something like that. Mm. What's up? Uh, Hector Carrera. <laughs> I think I remember seeing him when we were on Facebook. Oh, yeah? It sounds familiar. And he says, wow. Nice. Well, hello. Welcome. Let's finish up some of these very last boring to watch delicate details. <laughs> I always think that stuff like this would be so boring to watch, but I'm always surprised. <laughs> well, these live videos get saved on YouTube, right? They do on this platform, yeah, which is what's going to be really nice, I think, about doing these moving forward versus uh, Instagram. They get saved on uh, Facebook as well. Uh, but they get buried in the news feed, and eventually nobody knows they're there anymore. But once this one's done, I'm pretty sure it'll be here forever. Pretty sure. Oh, Lucy. <laughs> so dramatic. That's funny. I always know it's Lucy because Ellie doesn't whine like this. <laughs> That's funny. All right, just a couple little bit more blings. And we're just about there. So make sure we have enough. What's that? Mom, oh, we're so close. Right there. Hey, guys. We. <laughs> I need more coffee. Yeah, I'm ready for coffee. <laughs> I'm going to come over this pencil area a little bit with uh, with paint. I have it reduced a lot with water, but just so I can kind of build that nice smooth area in there as opposed to a really harsh light highlight, just kind of helps build everything. <laughs> Dog is busy being incredibly dramatic right now. I'm dog dying. She can hear you when you're saying that. Uh-uh. Uh -huh. Oh, man. <laughs> Whoops. And Hector says hi from Columbia. And Hello there. Really, you are so clean with your sketches. Love it. Thank you very much. I'm just bouncing in a couple of these little tiny highlights that, that add a nice little detail without being over the top. Just because there is there's actually very few on this particular car just because the angle that it was drawn in just didn't really call for overdoing it too much which is nice but highlights are kind of my favorite part mm -hmm. so i didn't really leave my space i didn't leave my root self space to do a whole lot of them but it's just the nature of the way that the layout worked out but i think it looks good i think everything looks the way that it should and it looks pretty good on the camera screen there sure so clean out my paintbrush here. And even though I like look at stuff like this, I'm like, yeah, it's done. I'm going to walk out of here in 10 minutes and I'm going to come back in and work on it for another 30 minutes. <laughs> yep. Because of all these little teeny tiny things, especially once the, the camera's out of the way, I can start to look at it a little bit more deliberately and go, oh, well, yeah, I can just tighten up this, tighten up that. And that's, that's really where the work comes into these pieces. The details look good. It's that last 5% of everything. And it really sharpens everything up. Um, but it can also be detrimental. Eventually, you spent too much time on something that didn't call for it. So, well, that's the habit of mine. To just get overly carried away with everything. Like I'm doing right now, for example. And we'll say that some days where it's like, oh, it's a really simple thing. It shouldn't take me very long. And then I come home at the end of the day and he's like, 
I put way too much time into it. That's most days. Yeah. I work on this for way too long. Well, I didn't think this was going to be simple. This, thankfully, was simple. Even though we're closing on two hours, it'd be a great stopping point, actually. Um, but I wanted to be able to show something all the way through. I didn't show the sketch phase, but I posted the sketch uh, a few days ago on social media anyways. So I didn't think there'd be any reason to go backwards. But on the Instagram live videos, for example, it's exactly 60-minute window, and then it cuts off automatically anyways. So I only get... I either have to jam through something way too quick or I only get to do part of a rendering. So this was really, really nice to be able to do all of it in a single sitting, even though it seems like it took a long time. Two hours actually start to finish on something like this is not bad, especially for something that looks so cool. <laughs> so I'm just going to hit this uh, harsh highlight a little bit more. Since I'm here, I've already got the paint mixed up. I haven't stepped out of the room and changed my mind yet. Cool. That adds a nice little brim to that whole thing there. Which is cool. I dig it. We're good, man. We're good. Yeah, I think I'm just going to sign this one and move on. Oh, wait. Hang on. <laughs> hang on. Well, I just saw something. Yes, yeah, this is just this is what it's like to make artwork. Yeah, we're done. Oh, hang on. I said I was going to fix this little area here. And I forgot to do it. Wait for it. Hang on. I'm not 100% done ever. My dogs are definitely ready for me to be done. They, they want love. They do. And it is raining outside, so they can't even be outside. They can't even go outside like real dogs. Mm -hmm. So sad. So sad. All right. So now I'm done again for the now time. I just got a sign this guy. I just have to find the exact right type of pen that I would use, which is somewhere. Bear with me just a moment. We'll wait for the one true pen. Hey, where did it go? <laughs> where did I head? Uh, this is what I'm looking for. I just don't know if it's working. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hang on, hang on, Lucy. Daddy's almost done. Yep, almost done. There we go. Again, it's always good to have a test piece of paper to make sure that everything's working good. So, I'll paint dry. Ready to jam here. And so concludes our video. Thank you guys so much for jumping in and, uh, and checking out the video. We're really excited to do more stuff on YouTube. Not all of it's probably going to be this long format, but we rarely get an opportunity to share the entire process all the way through. So I hope that uh, this sheds some light on the information, and uh, hopefully lots of people come and check out the video to see what it's like to have one, one of these come together from beginning to end. Thank you guys again. I'll see you later. Please subscribe. Please subscribe.